Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to our webinar this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you're joining from. Um, we'll be reviewing the SAS Innovation Framework led by Bruce Lee Weigel, Senior Product Manager at Blackboard, and Tim Grady, a Senior Technical Consultant on our consulting team. Our agenda for today, we will review the changes that are being made um, is snapshot support status. We'll then talk about the SAS integration framework um, and, and jump into a, a demo. Um, so again, keep those questions coming. If you have them, we'll be monitoring and chat and um, you could raise your hand to jump on the microphone if that's easier. And then we'll talk about the ICM SAS framework controller and other available services. I will let um, Wade and Tim both introduce themselves and then we'll get started for today. Thank you. Uh, this is Wade Weichel. As uh, mentioned by Marissa, I'm a member of the Blackboard Learn product management team. I'm going to first just give a little bit of an overview before turning things over to Tim to really go into more detail about the integration framework. But first, just wanted to start with a bit of information about um, the change in status to Snapshot, some of its components. Um, oops. Reshare that here. Sorry about that. All right. Um, for a number of years, the legacy integration method has continued alongside the new integration framework, which was introduced a number of years ago. And while Snapshot has remained static, the SIS integration framework has continued to gain new functionality over time. Uh, over time, there's been support for additional data types, such as terms and institutional hierarchy. Uh, and we've also uh, added uh, additional integration types, uh, so introducing support for a learning information services, which is a standard from IMS Global, uh, initially with version one, uh, then with version two draft, and then later the final specification. Uh, and that included also adding support for the LIS outcomes uh, uh, web services. And we've been adding additional uh, integration capabilities with student information systems as well over time. Uh, so if, for example, in the Q4 2015 release of 9.1, we've added journey, uh, journey functionality, which is a generic um, interface for exchanging assignment and grade data with student information systems and the Blackboard Learn Gradebook. Uh, that included supporting a, a generic file support, additional uh, uh, or leveraging LIS for SOAP web services and adding some REST web services as well. And in the most recent uh, release of Blackboard Learn 9.1, the Q2.16 release, we're extending uh, as well a new integration framework that includes student information system data, and that is support for REST APIs, uh, so REST web services, including common objects such as courses, users, and events. So that leads us to discussion around Snapshot and its deprecation and removal. Uh, I will note that in 2012, there was a support announcement made about the deprecation of Snapshot. Uh, it was a recommendation made at that time to transition to the SIS integration framework and that we would be uh, announcing an end of Savannah removal at a future time. Uh, since that time, uh, Snapshot has received some critical fixes, uh, security, and, and other changes that we had to make with new versions to keep it functioning. Uh, so that included changes in uh, underlying infrastructure, such as Java changes and so forth. Uh, so then, a couple of months ago, we've announced that we are ending support and removing uh, the Snapshot tools in a future release. So the timeline for that looks like uh, the following. Uh, the first is with the Q2 2016 release, we have ended support of the Snapshot client tool. Uh, so this is a very specific, it is a standalone application. It lives on a, a separate server, it has a different installer, uh, and it is used for processing remote SOAP transactions. Uh, so this is in very very specific scenarios where the processing of snapshot data occurs on a completely separate server than the Blackboard Learn environment. Uh, there is no change at all to the snapshot command line tools. So these are the tools that live 
on the application server itself. Uh, with the Q4 2016 release, the release that will be out later this year, there is no additional change. The snapshot command line tool will remain within that release. And what we're announcing is that with next year's uh, first half of the year release, the Q2 2017 release, we will be removing uh, the snapshot client tool. Um, and the reason for doing this really goes back to what you saw on the earlier slides. We continue to expand and invest in and enhance uh, um, the newer integration frameworks, uh, both the SIS integration framework as well as what we are doing with REST web services uh, and Grades Journey. We want to be focused on, on bugs and enhancements on those solutions uh, and not spending um, valuable developer time with each release, making sure that Snapshot continues to function as is when we have other solutions that accomplish the same tasks for data integration. And with that, I will turn it over to Tim Grady. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Wade. So good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on when you're joining from. Um, Tim Grady, I'm a senior technical consultant with Blackboard, and I deal mostly with uh, working with institutions to uh, work with the SAS framework, so moving them off the command line snapshot and onto the SAS framework. And I'm looking forward to uh, giving you a little demo this morning. Uh, before I get into the demo, let's just talk a little high level. Uh, so, you know, background, a lot of you are already familiar with this, the way of managing the SAS data, you could do things manually, use the uh, batch upload tools, the old upload of a CSV file with a certain order uh, that those fields need to be provided, legacy snapshot that a lot of you may already be uh, on and then looking to transition off of over the next year. Um, the SAS framework, which is the, the main topic for today, and those REST services that uh, Wade mentioned have now been released and we'll have some future enhancements moving forward. Uh, as I was saying, I really want to talk about the SAS integration framework today. Um, the, the framework supports multiple data formats, so there's uh, different IMS standards that are supported, and I'll, I'll talk about a little more detail once I get into my environment and do the, the live demo, uh, but it supports multiple data formats, and you can mix and match these. So uh, if you're familiar, I've heard of LAS 2.0, that's an XML-based web service, you, know, you can utilize that along with a flat file, delimited file option. So as you're maybe moving off a snapshot and, and looking at other possibilities that your SAS might provide, just know that you can do uh, multiple integration types with the SAS framework. Um, supports different entity types, and I'll, I'll the next slide we'll have a, a detailed discussion of that, but you can make use uh, support for the new terms, functionality, hierarchy, and uh, do course cross-listing, so combining your enrollments uh, that might be cross-listed on your SAS into one course on the learn side. So some of the, the requirements around the SAS framework, and it's really no different uh, for the most part from things you might be doing with the, the snapshot command line. So each SAS, you know, it's unique in, in how you're pulling that data out of the SAS system. One SAS system, such as PeopleSoft, has different fields from banner or colleague. So as you're defining that, you know, you're going to have things specific to your SIS. Um, you'll need to look at some of the you know, unique situations with your SIS as far as the data that needs to be uh, generated, specifically talking about enrollments. You know, do you need to provide the enrollment uh, when a student drops within the file? Um, there's a mode that I'll talk about that can handle disabling an enrollment when it's not included in the file. Some SIS is when a student drops from the course, it's completely removed uh, from the SIS. So Nothing to send across. Um, the framework, again, is, is similar to the snapshot, almost identical with a few additions uh, to support that new functionality. But as far as the, you know, the uh, more defined header values and fields that you would pass across in that extract, one thing I will customization you can do to those header uh, fields. So I'll show that when we get in the UI. So for the SAS framework, it's part of the, the Learn feature sets built into the product, can support those multiple integration options. Um, you can configure one or more integrations. So in my today, I'll show you the example where we have more than one integration, what I'll call a configuration set up to process data. Um, and it allows for a lot of configuration options. So you'll see um, we can set what is going to be allowed to be updated via the integration. You can map the fields that you want to have populated all directly through the user interface. The big changes with the SAS framework from command line snapshot are around the 
uh, way that data is automated or processed or gets to the learn environment. So on the learn side, there's going to be an endpoint URL exposed that's waiting for data to be posted to it. And it's the same for any of the integration uh, types. Their HTTPS endpoint URL is exposed. So one of the things to consider is you know, how the data is going to get to that new endpoint URL. Um, starting from scratch, you know, you would likely just push the data from your SAS side over to the SAS framework endpoint URL. Um, later on, I'll talk about some options that are available through our integration, customization, and maintenance team. So some of you might be utilizing the uh, snapshot controller that pulls files from an SFTP server and processes those on the learn with the command line snapshot. Um, there is a similar SIS framework controller that will pull the data from an SFTP server, but then post it to those endpoint URLs for the SIS framework. So a high, high level uh, overview of the data flow. Again, it's slightly different in the way the data gets transferred. So it'd be generated from your SIS system into your various uh, delimited data files for the, the uh, delimited snapshot process, you do an HTTPS post to the SAS framework where the endpoint URL is exposed and then the data gets processed on the learn side. The data type supported, um, everything that was supported through snapshot is supported through the SAS framework flat file um, with some additions that I'll talk about. The one thing I want to point out from uh, command line snapshot is it previously had student enrollments and faculty assignments, teaching assistants as two separate data types. With the SAS framework, they have been combined together under this uh, concept of course membership. So it's really just the role within the file, um, either student, instructor, teaching assistant, that is going to uh, set the role on the learn side. Um, some of the new functionality within the SIS framework is the ability to create an institutional hierarchy structure. So you can create a school, department, course type structure. You can delegate administrators. So this is often used for institutions that want to give department chairs or deans access to a certain set of courses, but you may not be able to enroll them in every single course because your SIS system doesn't have that information. Um, so you can assign them as an administrator to a particular node, set up the system role capabilities, privileges they should have, and then they can access the courses that are just within their hierarchy node or the nodes that fall below it. Um, this is also used uh, frequently for enterprise surveys um, within LEARN, where you can push out enterprise surveys to uh, students enrolled in courses that belong to a particular node or to instructors that are teaching uh, courses that belong to a particular nodes, so that has some, some functionality related to enterprise surveys as well. Uh, Terms is also a new integration uh, data type supported through the SAS framework, so you can create your, your terms such as spring, fall, summer, or however your terms might be set up within your institution. Um, this has, again, support for enterprise surveys, so pushing out surveys just to courses within a particular term. Uh, can allow for grouping on the My Courses module, group the courses that students or instructors are a part of um, based on the term that that course section belongs to. And then these associations, these are all related to getting either the user accounts, courses, or organizations linked up to the institutional hierarchy. So with that, let me uh, switch to my environment. on the other screen. All right. So uh, the first thing I wanted to point to is the Learn Help uh, site. Uh, you can get a lot more information that I'll be able to cover in the hour session that we have today. Uh, so if you go to the Learn Help site and do a search for SAS Framework Overview, the first two links, the SAS Framework Overview, and then there's also a an area for migrating from command line snapshot to the SAS framework. So these are the two, two places really to take a look at after today's session um, to get some further detail, again, more than I'll be able to uh, cover on today's session. 
So going into my Blackboard environment, the, the SAS framework is all configured within the system admin area. So again, this is a nice benefit from the command line snapshot where everything was done at the uh, server level. So you had to access it directly from the, the back end of the server. Everything can be configured here through the user interface on the learn side for the data that's going to be processed or the fields that can be updated. So under the building blocks area, the first link data integration is where we'll go. And the, the two areas that you'll really be concerned with related to the integration process is the student information systems integrations section. Uh, I'll go to here in, in one minute. Um, but also the data sources. So those very familiar with data source keys and, and managing data source keys maybe by ter per term. Uh, you might have been doing this either with the snapshot client or the snapshot command line tools. There was a data source manager as part of that to disable records within a particular data source key or purge records of a particular data source key. Um, this was actually added to the UI admin functionality, I think back in service pack six even of 9.1. Um, so it's there, you can do the same disable and purge this source key from this area. I'm going to concentrate mainly on the student information systems integrations area. Um, here's where we can set up those different configurations. So if I hover over create integration, we'll see there's really four uh, IMS standards listed here. The snapshot XML, which you could use with command line snapshots, really IMS 1.01 um, was that standard. Uh, there's also support for IMS Enterprise 1.1. 1.1 uh, Vista was specific to an XML format that WebCT used um, and that Banner exported. So if you have a component on the SIS system that might be utilizing this older IMS standard, there are integration options to, to utilize that XML. Um, the LIS 2.0 final, this is the, the latest IMS uh, specification uh, XML based web service for integrating users, course sections, enrollments, and terms, and also set that, that outcomes to read grade data back to the SAS. For today's call, since we're concentrating, uh, concentrating mainly on transitioning from command line snapshot to the framework, I'm going to look at the snapshot flat file because this is what most people uh, would be using for uh, command line snapshot. And I see there might be a question, so feel free to uh, go ahead and add that in the chat and we'll take a look at it as it comes up. Unless someone accidentally hit the, the raise hand. Uh, so what I have set up in my environment are, are two configurations. And this is typically when I work with institutions, my recommendation of how to set it up. So you'll have a configuration that's always going to be processing your user data, the creation of your terms, or that hierarchy structure. So those things that I, I say are, aren't term bound, like your course sections and enrollments, you know, those are specific to a term on your SIS system. So I'll create a configuration just for, for those data that spans multiple terms. And then you'll create a configuration for uh, processing that term specific data, the course sections and, and memberships. Uh, the reason why you would do this is there's a, a slight difference in how the command line snapshot would manage data that it's going to disable that's missing from the file uh, that was previously in the file versus how the SAS framework does it. So the SAS framework keeps track of when a record is processed, which one of these configurations process the record. So it knows that it created a user or created a term with this user's terms and hierarchies configuration versus uh, it keeping track and knowing that it created a course section or an enrollment faculty assignment through this summer 2016 configuration. Uh, I'm going to create a new integration to show you some of the options on the setup page. Uh, so the first thing to do is you need, need, need to give it a unique name. So I'm going to call this Fall 2016 Course and Memberships. Uh, you can give it a, an optional description if you want to do that. You don't need to. This shared username is automatically generated by the learn environment. This is to ensure that's unique. So part of the, the automation posting process um, is to utilize this username and password in that HTTPS post. Uh, this is how Learn knows which configuration it should be processing the data set that's being sent across um, to that endpoint URL. I can't change this. Um, I can try to delete. It's not going to allow me to do it. Um, but then I can enter in a 
password value that I want to use as part of that posting. And I always like to let people know that this shared username and password is only used to um, authenticate to that endpoint URL. You cannot log in to learn with this account to access the system. It's really only to validate the posting of data to that endpoint URL. Uh, change my feed file delimiter to match what my extract from my SAS system might be. So I'll set it to, to pipe for my demo data for today. The integration status. So there's three, three statuses we can set this particular configuration to. By default, it's inactive. So I'm not going to be able to upload data to the integration. Uh, I'm not going to be able to post anything to the endpoint URL using this username and password. Um, I can just set up the initial configuration, I eventually have to come back and set it to either active or testing. What testing allows me to do is to upload a file or post a file to the endpoint URL, but it's just going to validate that header line to make sure that the, the header fields I am including in my file match what the integration is expecting for that data type, and that each record in my file has the same number of fields as defined by my header, but it's not going to create any users, not going to create any courses within the learn environment. So this is beneficial, especially when you're maybe moving from command line snapshot to the framework, you're adding in some of the new fields that be, be supported with the new process. You can just validate that you're including values in the headers and that you've had the appropriate records, um, appropriate fields with each record that falls below. Uh, active will create the data, so it does the same checking of the, the header record that it matches what it expects to see for that data type, but it will create the user or create the course. Uh, the log verbosity, so there's multiple levels of uh, the logging, which is done to a database table and then exposed through the user interface. So uh, depending on how much time we have, I'll try to get to the, the logging aspect of this integration and show you that. Um, for a production environment, I usually errors and warnings, uh, just because there are certain things that will pop up as a warning. So maybe I didn't create a term um, on my learn environment, but my course field mapping is set up to uh, associate a course to a term. If that term doesn't exist, it'll throw it as a warning. Um, course still gets created, just tells me that it didn't create that term association. Uh, all diagnostic messages would write out a, a record in the log for each um, record that is in the file. Probably good working with the integration to get used to it and see that things are processing as expected. Um, and then the all diagnostic and debug is really when you're trying to troubleshoot an issue. So it's going to show you all of the data with each record listed out in the log along with how each field uh, is being, being mapped as it's processing the, the record. Again, for a production, production environment, errors and warnings um, is the, the best option. The, the next section, another big change from command line snapshot to the framework is the, the assignment of the data source key value. So for command line snapshot, this was done through the command um, or through a properties file where you'd specify this in a snapshot properties file or in the snapshot command that was being run. Um, with the framework, we have two options. Again, in my, my experience, what I usually recommend is the first one. Um, I'll show you on a subsequent page where we can define the data source key by data type, but this allows a little bit of flexibility that I'll talk about um, where you don't have to define it here at the, the main configuration level, although I'm free to do that, or I can create a new data source key. Um, there is some benefit to doing the first option, and it allows me to group uh, the processing of course sections and then the, the enrollments, faculty assignments for those course sections under one configuration. So I'm going to use this first option and go into more detail later on on how I'll uh, set the data source key. Batch ready prefix really would be used if you had multiple SIS systems populating a single Blackboard instance where the unique identifiers for users or courses could be duplicated across those two different SIS systems. This is just to ensure that you know, one institution's SIS um, uniquely has identified their batch UIDs versus another institution. Uh, same thing with the parent hierarchy node. If multiple institutions set up, one school needs to define their hierarchy underneath a particular node um, in the institutional hierarchy on the learn side versus where another school's configuration is set up to start that structure. And the last section of the, the main setup page is the advanced configuration for 
each data type that could be processed via the SAS framework configuration, we can define how this, this should be processing that data. Uh, so looking at the first one, we have the learn object type. The, the SAS objects, so this follows more of the IMS standard, if it has a name for that data type, what it would call it. And then some, some uh, configurable options here for inserts and updates. So what this means, smart inserts and updates, is that learn will first check based on the, the batch ID or external person key, does this user exist? If it does, then it's going to just update the field information that might be provided in the extract with what it's allowed to uh, update based on a, a subsequent configuration page we'll look at. Um, if the user doesn't exist, then it's going to insert or create that user. You could, if there's a, a business need to, to do this, um, you could set it to only update users or only create users or completely uh, prevent it from creating creating users at all if you, if you needed to do that for some specific business use case. The delete uh, column option is how we tell this configuration it should behave when we use either the delete mode, uh, which would disable uh, users in this particular setup. So we provide a list of users that we want to disable, um, just puts them in that disabled state. I could change this to purge, although I, in my experience, I usually never recommend doing that. So you don't accidentally delete a user uh, from the system if an incorrect file might happen to be uploaded or posted. This delete option also uh, controls the behavior when we use the what's called the refresh mode with the SAS framework was the snapshot mode with command line snapshot. So a, a record that is missing from the file that was previously in the file the last time it was run against this configuration, it's just going to disable that record. And again, if you want to just prevent any possible disabling, um, if you know you never disable users, you can change this to do not disable and purge, and then there's no risk of this configuration disabling any user records. I always like to point out at the bottom, there's some that are defaulting to purge. These are because these are just associations of other data types. Uh, so there is no disabled state, uh, row status equal to disabled. Um, there either the relationship exists or it does not. So that's why there's just this purge option for these. And then the retrieval, um, this is really showing up due to some things that are supported through the LIS 2.0 outcomes that allows for the retrieval of data by the SAS. Um, so that's why this column is showing up. So I'll click Submit. Uh, section of the SAS framework uh, that I want to show you is a little more configuration options. I just noticed a question from Gail. Uh, so yes, if well, the if the user account is disabled, then enrollments, um, while they not be disabled at the database level, the user wouldn't be able to get into their courses because their their account is is at the that disabled state. So they they wouldn't be able to log in to learn while their account's disabled. So their enrollments essentially would be disabled. Uh, yeah, I mean, the enrollments will stay active, but the user wouldn't, wouldn't be able to get into the course yet. Um, so the, the next section of the SAS framework I want to take a look at is under the advanced configuration, where for each data type, I can specify the, the fields that I want to populate via the integration process. Um, I do want to point out that uh, one of the nice features with the framework is, let's say you're setting this up in your test stage environment, uh, you've getting get the field mapping set up, you can export the settings and then import them into another learn environment. So you'll see um, slightly tedious the first time we go to set up the configuration to optimize it for the processing of the, the SAS data but just know that you're able to export the settings and then import them within the same Blackboard instance or import it into another Blackboard instance. So I want to first take a look at users and the field mapping. So there's a lot of fields uh, that could be mapped for users or quiz when we look at each subsequent page. Um, but most of these fields, in my experience, institutions don't end up populating on the learn side. So I've already pre-configured this to what I call like an optimal configuration. Um, what we have listed out here is the, the learn field we might want to populate 
is that field required for creation of the object? So batch UID or external person key required, a data source key value is required. Uh, the field to be changed when the data coming across in the feed might date. So check the box if you always want it to be set based on the SAS data. Uncheck it if you want to allow manipulation on the learn side and, and not have it be overwritten by the integration process. Those, those options are usually, uh, or fields are usually limited, what you want to allow update, but one example might be the availability indicator of a course. Your courses might be created as unavailable by default, and then the instructor turns it on when they're ready to do so. Um, does the field need to be unique? So it just lets you know batch UID needs to be unique for each record. User uh, name, user ID needs to be unique. The invalid data rule. So this is sometimes a little uh, ambiguous as far as what this means, uh, what it considers an invalid. So one good example is the email field. So learn does a check for the at symbol uh, is one of the checks to see if it's a, a valid email address. Um, doesn't contain that that at symbol the way I have it configured now is it's going to skip the record so it wouldn't process that user because a valid email address was not uh, provided in the extract file. Uh, then the source field this is the one where most of the changes occur from when you first come into a, a default mapping so again I've already set this. Um, one of the ways to optimize the processing of the data is to set the fields that you do not care to have set via the integration to do not populate this field with feed data from the drop down options. Um, so typically when you come into a configuration, um, it'll have some default mapping, so person and then uh, some value that it's mapping to in the extract file. Uh, anything you don't care about, you should set to do not populate. This helps speed up the processing of each record as it's ignoring those fields don't care about uh, to, to set via the integration and those fields that you're passing in the feed file. Or in this example with the data source key, here's how I can set the data source key value at the lower user level versus that more global option we saw on the previous configuration page. So I can set this specifically to SIS underscore users. So this is just a very uh, basic custom script. Um, I'll try to talk a little bit more about uh, custom scripting here in a little bit. There's a lot of information that's available on the help page, so when you go to that SAS framework overview section, you'll be able to get to the, the custom scripting pages um, that fall underneath there. So on this page, I'll map uh, what fields I expect to have coming across in my integration. So I expect to have an email, first name, last name, uh, password, while I may not have password in my file. What this mapping will do is it will randomly generate a value. So maybe I'm using um, Active Directory authentication or CAS, Shibboleth. So I really don't care what the Blackboard stored password is. Learn will still generate a value to store in the database. Um, and this default mapping will just do that. So it will use the password fields if it's included. If it's not included, it randomly generates a value. Um, so I set up my mappings the, the way I want based on the fields that I'll, I'll provide. Another one I want to point out is the, the row status. So while it may not be included in the file, by leaving the default mapping, Learn knows if the record is included in the file, it should re-enable it had it previously been disabled by uh, it being excluded from the file when using that refresh mode. So I want to take a look at something specific to courses and memberships, so a little more uh, complicated field mapping setup. Let me go to, to courses, go to field mapping. So again, I would typically go through, set these to, to do not populate based on what data is going to be included in my extract. Um, wanted to jump down to the data source key field to show you an example. So this is a little more complicated custom script. The, the custom scripting option, and let me just show you here in the course name. So when you select to use a custom script, it's going to open up this text box where you can enter in some code. What this is doing is it's taking the data that's being included in the file and we're reusing it. So this is very commonly done for 
um, institutions moving from command line snapshot to the framework will utilize a custom script similar to this. Uh, it's likely that the external course key field or the course ID field in your file um, has a term code in it. So what I want to do is mimic that, that, uh, that data source key assignment term specific, and I'm reusing that term data that's already in one of those fields provided in the extract. Uh, so this makes use of JavaScript um, in, in technical terms. It's a uh, Rhino JavaScript engine is what's running to, to parse the JavaScript that's in here. So I can use JavaScript functions. Um, if you're familiar with JavaScript, I'm using the split function. Uh, the, the course data that I'm entering in, I have a, a unique CRN code uh, concatenated with a term which is separated by a period in between. So I'm, I'm splitting on that period character I have in my external course key so that I can read the term code. I know which position in my uh, external course key construction that term code is. So this is allowing me to dynamically pull in that term code and then set the data source key to, uh, I think it's like 2016, 30 underscore courses or you know, I can construct this however I want to be term specific. So again, uh, just to, to summarize, this is the reason why on that main configuration page when we looked at the data source area for how the data source keys would be assigned, I chose the first option so that I could do this dynamic term based uh, custom script on the data source key field versus one that's globally set for the configuration. And I can do something similar on enrollments. So mapping for enrollments. I have a, a almost identical custom script in the data source key field where I'm reading the external course key. Again, I know I have the term code in that uh, field, pulling that out so that I can have a different data source key for my membership, course membership enrollment data versus the data source key I'm assigning to my course data. The other feature I want to show you here on uh, the mapping, so there are course copy settings, but this mimics a lot of what you've probably seen in the admin when you do a course copy. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip over that one for right now. Uh, I did want to go through and show you that you can do some customization to the header fields that would be included in the extract. So if you really don't want to call it external course key and you just want to call it maybe, you know, SIS course key, uh, you could change it here and then in your extract file you could use SIS underscore course underscore key, learn when it reads that data it knows that it really should be mapping it to what learn typically uh, defines as the external course key so it allows you for that, for that flexibility should you want to do that. Um, it also allows for you to add additional header fields in the file. So I always get the question, is this adding fields to the database? No, it's not. It's just allowing you to pass, you know, customized fields in the extract file that might make more sense, you know, for your, the people generating the extract to call it something else. And then from that drop down option we saw on that previous field mapping page, you'd see that, that custom header field listed here. Um, what I wanted to go through was the export import options uh, so that you can see how I can export the settings from one configuration and easily import it into another. So if you remember back a few minutes ago, I created that fall 2016 course and membership configuration. Um, I've created some custom scripts in this one that we just looked at. I want to put those same custom scripts into that other fall uh, 2016 configuration I created. So I can export these settings. Let me just quickly save this. So it pulls everything into an XML file, all the field mappings for all the configurations. I'm going to go back. I'll go, I'll go to my fall 2016 course membership. I'm going to go to the advanced configuration. And I'll do import settings. Just need to browse for that file. So here's that XML file that got generated from the export. Submit that. Um, sometimes it does reorder the fields, but if I find my courses and go to field mappings, we can see the same 
same scripts that I had in that summer 2016 are now in here. So this is how I can quickly create a new configuration for the new term. Again, the reason why we do this is to keep the data contained within that specific term. So if I'm using the refresh mode, which would disable records that are missing from the file, uh, it's not going to impact the previous term. So when I run my fall data using refresh, it's not going to disable all my enrollments or courses for the summer 2016. Let me jump back to the main. The, the other functionality that it provides, again, it's nice from command line snapshot and what you had to do with the remote snapshot client. If you wanted to process data, you know, you'd have to use that client to push it across. Here you can upload the data directly through the user interface. So I can browse for a file on my computer. So I have my extract. Here's the summer 2016. I want to select that. Um, the data type, so I can select what type of data I am uploading. It defaults in alphabetical order. Do want to point out that user data is called person here on this page. Um, enrollment data would be course membership. So I'm going to choose course and then I can select the operation type that I want to process that information in. So store is the same as the manual mode with a command line snapshot. So it's just going to add and update records. Nothing gets disabled. Complete refresh would disable records that I had previously processed through the summer course and configuration, but is now not in the file. And then the delete would be, I want to disable or purge based on how I configured that, that main configuration page, the records that I'm including in my file. So my usual practice is if I'm manually uploading the data uh, through the UI, I likely just want to use the store mode. So I'll just submit that. And it tells me that the file was successfully uploaded. It processes things in the background. So what that means is I could upload multiple files um, and it will process them in the order received. So if I have a course file that has 2,000 records and it's creating new courses, that could take some time to finish. If I upload an uh, a enrollment file after that, you know, that'll be next in the queue. So whatever order I upload the files, that's the order they'll be processed in. And it's the same thing when you post things um, to the external endpoint URL, which I'll show you here in one minute. Um, I also want to point out that there's this reference code that is returned back. Um, we'll see when I take a look at the logs, um, you can use this reference code to filter the log. So if I just want to see the log messages specific to this particular upload, you know, I can use this code to, to filter those logs. The, the automation example that I'll show you, um, the way I have it set up, it, it'll capture that when I do a posting so I can ha go back and get this reference code if I want to see um, what was posted you know yesterday I, I'll be there's a way that you can set up that automation process to, to track that so we can see on the um, where I have my configuration set up, it says the, this last event. So it tells you the last time, this is when it logged a message to the, the, the log table. Um, so sometimes if there's no errors, um, this last event is not going to change if all the data is going through, uh, no errors are being logged. At the end, it will provide a summary message. Uh, so let me go to the view logs. So we can see based on how I have my uh, log verbosity set up to just errors and warnings. The data I uploaded contained two records. There were no errors and warnings, so I just get this summary success message. Um, I can click on this record. If I scroll down, it gives me more detail, so it tells me how many records were processed, how long it took, you know, the total number of successes versus the total number of errors. Um, based on a demo I did yesterday, you can see uh, the log verbosity set up slightly different where uh, I still get that summary message at any log verbosity level, but I had it set to the all diagnostic message. So I can see for those success records that were in my file, so this is per enrollment that I had in my course membership file, it writes out a, a log message. Again, probably more detail than you need in a normal uh, production environment. Most people just care about the errors or warnings that might be occurring. Also want to point out this, this reference code column. So this goes back to what we saw in that success message. Um, this is the reference code. You know, if I just paste in 
this is the reference code associated to that file I manually uploaded. Um, if I would click on one of the particular records in this reference code column, it automatically populates this reference code uh, filter up top with just the records that are belonging to that reference code that I clicked on. So again, that's something uh, important to, to keep in mind. Um, when you click on that particular column, it will automatically populate and, and filter uh, based on that reference code. Oops, went too far. Uh, next thing I wanted to show is, is automating pushing the data from uh, an external system. So under each configuration page, there's an HTTP information. Uh, this exposes the endpoint URLs that are available on the learn side. Um, the endpoint URLs are, are pretty much the same. The values that are going to be different per configuration is going to be the username and password. Again, the username for this summer 2016 course and membership configuration is unique to it. If we go to the spring 2016 or that user's configuration, its username value is going to be different. The password can be whatever you want. It can be the same password for, for each configuration. Um, I also want to point out there's this data set status uh, URL. So the, the point of this URL would really be if you have large data sets, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of records, and if you have the configuration set to errors and warnings, and you know, hopefully you have very few errors, sometimes it's difficult to know where the integration process is um, when it's lar uh, processing a large data set. So what this URL allows you to do is you can take that reference we saw is provided back when you upload a file, or we'll see when I do a posting via an external HTTPS post, it gives you that reference code and you would add that reference code to the end of this URL. When you submit this back to learn using the username and password, it'll provide some details as far as records have been processed so far, how many errors might have occurred so far, how many warnings. So it gives you some insight on, on what's taking place um, as it's processing the records. Um, so for the purposes of, of automating the process, again, based on the business needs that you have, you'll likely set up your automation um, to be sending the data to a particular URL. So store URL, if you only want to add and update records, you know you never want to disable courses um, versus maybe course membership. You know, you're pulling data that's term specific and you need to disable enrollments missing from the file on how your SIS tracks that, so then you could use the refresh URL. Again, the URLs are pretty much the same. The only pieces that change are the last two uh, parts of that URL, the data type that you're posting, and then the mode you want to process that data in. So if I go to my example, and it doesn't look like it's switched over. I was trying to show my example curl command. Um, come on, second, I need to I need to stop sharing and reshare. It seems to be switching over automatically. Okay, so now you should be able to see my example um, curl command. Um, this is, I'd say, not too complex, but a little more than just the basics. Um, what I'm doing here is I want to be able to capture that uh, success message that comes back with that reference code. So I'm, I'm just doing a couple, I'll call quote unquote, fancier things to get a, a uh, timestamp specific file to track that. Um, I'm specifying where my files are located. Uh, I'm using curl, so C U R L. It's a utility freely available on Linux can be used on Windows and it's just a way to uh, transfer data from one server or computer to another um, and it supports the HTTPS post method that the framework uh, needs to have for receiving data from that external system but uh, I've worked with institutions that had you know Java developers or .NET developers so they came up with their own process to do the posting of data you don't have to use curl but curl is just one of the ways that you can get data from your um, external uh, environment over to the learn learn environment um, so what I have here is a series of curl commands to post my user file 
my summer 2016 course file and my summer enrollments file. So again, I've just done a little bit fancier things to keep track of this when I go back to review to get those reference codes. Um, I've specified the username and password associated to the configuration on the learn side that I want it to process the information I'll be posting. So you can see that the uh, course data and the enrollment data is using the same username and password because I'm going to send to that summer 2016 configuration. And for the purposes of this demo, I am just using the store URL for all of them. So uh, I have that as a, a Windows bat file and I have curl on my computer. So if I want to post this data, I can simply uh, double click this and it quickly just popped open a, a command line window. And what it did it was connecting to my Blackboard environment and it was sending my user file, sending my summer course file and my summer membership file. So if I go back to my Blackboard environment, we can see that the last event time has now changed. So I know that my, my external posting has been processed um, on the Blackboard side. If I go to the view log, I can see the three records that I had uh, in my file get posted across and I have it set to the all diagnostic messages. So we see those, those three messages. Um, here's, here's the reference code listed here. Uh, let me just show you when I ran that, um, notice the way I had my bat file set up, it wrote, wrote out this SAS log. Um, within this SAS log file, let me open this with notepad, right? So I captured that reference code that we had seen when I uploaded the data manually. Um, the way I set up my automation file, it's capturing that here. So I can always go back and search the logs for the specific data I had uploaded at that particular time. So I'm going to switch back to uh, the PowerPoint here in one second, but I just wanted to make sure for those that were monitoring the um, chat, is there, is there any questions that make sense for me to review something in the UI before I switch back to the PowerPoint? Um, yeah, we can, I can definitely share, share the script I use for the curl process. There's also some examples that are on the help.blackboard.com uh, area uh, as well. Those, those even get a little more fancier with doing some, some things with, with curl. But yeah, happy, happy to share this example. Okay, so let me switch back to the PowerPoint and wrap up a few things. All right, so for those of you that um, might be using the snapshot controller, uh, some, some misception possibly uh, been going around that there isn't a, a framework version of that. So a lot of schools are, are, are using the automatic process of pulling data from an SFTP server um, over to the learn side. So there is a customization maintenance team has uh, developed one that works with the SAS framework process. So um, there is there is something that you can transition to um, if you're already uh, have that as part of an ICM contract, you can get the SAS framework controller version as well. Uh, so again, what I said, um, ICM can work with you to, to move your integration, you know, quote unquote, as is. So really not implementing any of the new functionality. Um, we, we recommend going through one of our, our services if you want to implement that, just because we have at this point, you know, four years of experience implementing institutional hierarchy or dealing with cross-listing, you know, talking through the different scenarios with institutions. So that's, you know, best served to, to work with a consultant directly um, to, to work through your specific needs um, if you want to use some of that newer, newer functionality that the uh, SAS framework supports. So for those of you that may not uh, be fam familiar with the snapshot controller and, and might be of some interest to you, you know, one of the reasons you would look at is there is reduced in 
introducing the, the change. So as you saw with how I was posting data through that curl process, you know, I have to set up a curl command when I want to post my fall 26 data. So for some schools, you know, that's that would be something your IT group would have to do, um, and you don't really want to have to handle that. Um, so you can use the framework controller. It's all going to be configured in the user interface. The Blackboard admin can configure what data file should be pulled from an SFTP server. So it moves moves that management process over to the Blackboard side versus something that might be within the IT. Um, that covers the, the second bullet point on, you know, the Blackboard admin has the control over the automation. So again, if you're using the snapshot controller, especially in a managed hosting environment, that's configured by a cron job running on this on the server, so you have no control over when that process runs. You have to put in a support ticket, have someone change the schedule. With the SAS framework, you can do that all through the UI. Um, with the framework controller, um, it's really you're you're getting ICM on the SAS framework. Controller is included as part of that, you know, so you have that 24/7 support through the ICM team uh, to support your SAS integration, and it is available for self-hosted, managed hosted, and SAS environments. Uh, looking at the controller in a little higher level detail, um, it allows you to do that scheduling. You know, when do you want the automation to run? It'll pull the files from an SFTP server. It sends out an email notification when the process is completed, and it will archive the file. So it can push them back to the SFTP server, but it can also it also locally store them using the content system and then it exposes that to an admin where they can review it from within the learn UI, the files that were processed. Um, so the data flow, again, a lot of you may already be familiar with this if you're using the command line snapshot. Um, the added piece from what we had seen with the framework uh, data flow earlier uh, on today's call, we just incorporate that institution SFTP where files, files are going to be pulled uh, by the framework controller and then posted to the SAS framework and it can push the data back. Um, some of the, the benefits, again, it's a GUI UI based configuration for the admin, so they have full control directly through the system admin area. They can set up the, the schedule and do a very basic, I want to run it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 6 a.m. You can do that or you can get a little more complex with a, a cron setup, so you want to run it every two hours, you can put in a cron schedule to run it in that fashion. Uh, You'll configure where the files will be picked up, so your SFTP server, set up that configuration, get email notifications when the process has completed. Um, there's some built-in to make sure that it doesn't overlap multiple processes, so it checks to see is the framework running something, and then I'm going to wait until we start running the next set of files. Uh, again, archiving allows you to see what was processed can be visible uh, through the user interface. It'll capture some of the log details. So it will it will check that data set status and it will get the, the summary message and let you know how many records were processed, how long it took. Um, the other thing that it provides is you can manually kick off the process. So again, something if you are using the command line snapshot controller you weren't able to do, here you can kick that off automatically. Um, so some of the prerequisites running out of time, so through this, um, it's available for April 2014 or higher. Self-managed or SaaS can run on Unix or Windows. Uh, expect that there's, you know, an integration already in place extracting data, uh, and then the, the institution would have to host that SFTP server. Uh, so some of the other services I want to quickly mention. Um, so ICM for the SAS framework include that SAS framework controller. So if you already have ICM for command line snapshot, you'd be able to transition to this. Um, but again, you might want to consider some other services. So those that are using snapshot, you likely want to maybe consider the our technical knowledge transfer. So you'd work with a consultant such as myself uh, to help you through the setup and, and best practices, considerations for maybe using the institutional hierarchy, um, using some of that other functionality that's now supported through the framework. And we also have a, a mentoring service. This is really intended for institutions that have no existing integration at all uh, to help you set up, you know, the extract of your users, courses, enrollments, and everything else you can do with the framework. And for those two, you can get ICM and the, the framework controller as part of those services. So we have about one minute left uh, for any 
additional questions that uh, anyone might have or we didn't cover in the chat. Okay. So we caught all the questions. Anything else before we wrap up for today? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Wade. Thanks, Tim, for the helpful information. We'll be sure to post this recording in the community site. Um, so be sure to check it out if you'd like to share with your colleagues. Um, great rest of their day and take care. Talk to you later.